and we are here. Thank you very much for joining. Uh, good, uh, good, good morning, good afternoon, good night. Uh, this is the large scale Scrum uh, uh, meetup. We are having a, a scheduled webinar today and we have a very, very special speaker, David Snowden, who is joining us from uh, the UK. Uh, David is a very um, well known and very articulate speaker, a very um, provocative, very um, tantalizing and uh, very cynical in the way he does his uh, presentations. Uh, David also um, has a very interesting career. He splits his uh, uh, work between being the founder, um, chief scientific officer of the Cognitive Edge of his own company, as well as the founder and director of the Center of Applied Complexity at the University of Wales. Uh, his name is very well known internationally in Europe, in the United States, all over the globe. He has pioneered a science-based approach to organizations drawing on anthropology, science, neuroscience, and complex adaptive, adaptive uh, systems uh, theory. Um, he also holds multiple positions as a university professor, as well as the visiting professor um, in such places as uh, Pretoria, uh, Bangor University of Wales, Hong Kong Polytechnic University, Canberra, uh, University of Surrey. David, uh, I have given, I think, a plenty uh, of bits of information about you to the community prior to this event. So I think I did the justice and there is more on the meetup as well as people can read about your uh, very rich career on their, uh, on their own. I uh, really appreciate you joining us today. Uh, without, without any further ado, I'm gonna pass the baton over to you. And uh, also you can have control. If you would like to share anything, it's up to you but more, 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 more so people want to hear you speak. Okay, so um, off to you. Okay, so uh, the phrase Zoombie is coming to mean a lot to me. So I've been on Zoom since 6 a.m. most days for the last couple of days. Yeah? Um, we're doing a lot of work on the whole COVID stuff at the moment, including sort of visions of the future, which I can send everybody links to. But I've got the chat area open. Um, I can't have questions, but if people want to put stuff in the chat, um, I'll be monitoring that as we go. And what I'm generally finding with Zoom is it makes sense to do shorter presentations and then open up to conversation. Because as a speaker, you're not getting the, um, the feedback you normally get from an audience. So you don't know what's working and what isn't. So my goal on here is to basically reduce the length of a presentation and then happily go into stuff on questions. But as I say, use the chat area. If I'm speaking too quickly, if there's something you don't understand, put it in there um, because that will actually help the um, feedback. Yeah. And somebody's just, you need, I need to do the screen sharing, Gene, not you, I think. Yes. Yes. That's, that's, that's true. And uh, so if you could un unshare and then I'll share. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Let me start sharing, and uh, instead of recording yeah. the uh, the faces, we're going to record your stuff. Yep. You have uh, the sharing capability now. Okay. So hopefully, you should now be seeing a slide set. Yes, indeed. Yeah. And now I can't see the I can't see the um, comments. Okay. So I'll I'll do this I'll, briefly. I'll try to monitor, David. I'll try to monitor them for you. Yeah, okay, so throw them in. Um, this is a um, cartoon from a partner of ours, Gabe in Void, um, which I use a fair amount at conferences. Yeah? They've got another really good one, which is all paths down are the same, but no path up is different. All paths up are different, but uh, there's a sort of element around, uh, it's, it's just to sort of set the tone. But the, con the title here is Real World in Agile. So this is a Timberwolf. Um, it's actually one of four or five variations of wild canine. They're highly resilient as a species. Um, they're the apex predator in many environments. Yeah? Uh, they're one of the first animals to be domesticated by man, and that's kind of like where things go wrong. So you have something with very little variation in the wild, you know, say five or six distinct species, um, the problem we got here is that as you increasingly domesticate the things, people breed for individual aspects of the species 
and you get this huge variety which is actually not resilient. It may look like it's got diversity in it, but the reality is none of these species are particularly effective compared with the wild. And I'm making a deliberate metaphor here to Agile. I mean, Agile as a movement started off as something which was a great set of ideas. It was produced within a ski resort. People came up with a manifesto. And then it took off. Interestingly, it took off because it got codified and domesticated. So there's kind of like a paradox here. Um, I said at a conference in Scotland recently, it was a pity Agile didn't really get dominated by XP in the early days rather than by Scrum. I um, mean, the Scrum people all stood up and cheered, but then I pointed out, sorry, the Agile, the XP people all stood up and cheered. But then I pointed out that XP people can't talk with executives or ordinary mortals because they live in their own universe. And what Scrum actually did was to put sufficient codification and structure in place that people felt they could adopt Agile. And to be honest, without Scrum, there would no, be no Agile movement. Yeah, even, even though it was highly structured. So this is a paradox um, we've got to kind of like be aware of. Yeah? Um, and our problem at the moment, I think, with um, Agile is it may actually be coming to the end of its days. Uh, I do a lot of corporate strategy work. And once something becomes highly commodified, that's when you introduce novelty. So at the moment, Agile is highly commodified. You've got Scrum, there's legal actions taking place between Scrum and one of the founders. You've got Safe, you've got Less, you've got Dad being adopted by the project management group. You've got a thousand and one certification schemes. Um, what you've got this is high level of commodification of which probably the most evil is, is Safe. And I make no hesitation in saying that. From my point of view, Safe was um, everything that Agile wasn't meant to be. But what it actually did is it made it safe to say that you were Agile, no irony in that, but not actually really make a change. And SAFE is effectively an accumulation of everything, um, in fact, anything anybody wants to buy. Uh, Dean will happily certify you if you actually just attend a few classes and read some slide sets every year. And to me, that's kind of like the antithesis of what we should, we should be doing um, within software development. So, from my point of view, Agile effectively has become you know, a, a sheep in wool's clothing. It's trying to pretend it's something wild and excited, um, but actually it's become extremely tame. And there are a variety of reasons for that. Yeah? I've mentioned that one. Yeah? Um, the certification scan is complete nonsense. Um, I see people's LinkedIn profiles and they've got 15 set of initials after their name. Yeah, mostly acquired by attending a two day course. I mean, I've got three sets of initials which I never bothered to put after my name, all of which were acquired by two or three years of study and a proper examination. So the certification scam is a real problem at the moment. And I know there's work pressure on it, um, but it's devaluing the whole concept because there's very little experience based in it. Third, and this is a key metaphor, um, too many people are creating recipe books and nobody's creating a chef. So when I first went to university, I had a recipe book. Um, I'd never cooked, well, I'd done some cooking before, but mainly under adult supervision, and this is 1972, so males were not generally regarded as people who had to cook. Um, and I sort of learned cooking from the recipe book, yeah, and I only had two. I've now got about 40 and I never follow a recipe because I've now got the experience. I regard recipe books as sources of ideas, but I adapt and flow on the time. So a recipe book user is great as long as you've got the conditions for which the recipe was designed. You've got all the right ingredients, all the right equipment. Um, but if you don't have all of that, the recipe book user can't adapt. Whereas a chef who has acquired two types of knowledge, deep practical knowledge through doing things, through serving an apprenticeship, and theoretical knowledge, they understand the theory of taste, and it's that combination of theory and practice that actually allows them to do things. Yeah. David, apologize, this is Gene. Are you, um, people that keep asking if you're on the same slide or you're advancing and they don't see you see same. I'm, I'm advancing, but it, yeah, we, this is a problem with Zoom sometimes. So what I'll do is I'll just put the, the slide up, yeah? Oh, okay, now, the, so there was a point to it. Okay, good. Okay, um, it means you'll see other stuff, but. Yeah, um, we see the 
the wolf, uh, the the bear, and the and the and the bull, and the sheep. Well, it's, it's a sheep in a, in a wolf skin. Yeah, yeah. thanks for the reference. Yeah. <laughs> so to me, I won't be able to do builds, but that's fine, right? Um, so I say too many chefs, not not enough. Too many recipe reviews and not enough chefs. Um, then we get some of these crazy things, like if I hear one more person say they're going to adopt the Spotify model, yeah, um, then I think I'm tempted to personally throttle them. Yeah? Um, and this is kind of like the McKinsey's line as well. Uh, if you actually talk with Spotify, and Spotify <coughs> did actually use Kinevin and all sorts of other things in their process, um, they actually undertook a journey, and you can't start at the end of somebody else's journey. You've got to live an equivalent journey of your own. Uh, and Spotify's journey continues. They're constantly changing the way they structure. But I saw one bank, for example, in Australia that just decided it would do the last writer for Spotify. And everything is done as this massive reorganization. Um, the reason it works for Spotify is they undertook it bit by bit, slowly, incrementally, worked out what worked in their context and what didn't, and then moved forward. So the danger with any types of framework which forces you into one way of doing things is kind of like problematic. Yeah. Um, then we get confusing correlation with causation. Now this is a massive problem in business books. So you all know the sort of classic book and you know, everybody does these. You know, this is a great, this is a brilliant new idea. Here it is, here are 55 cases of successful companies who've done what I'm talking about. You know, do this thing, you two will be successful. You know, it can be academically more valid. If you look at good, good to great, for example, the guy does 15, 20 years of research. Yeah, he interviews lots of people. He believes what they say. That's one problem. Yeah. But then from that, he constructs a framework and says, if you do these things, you two will be a great company. Now, it's a bit embarrassing at the moment because most of those companies have failed even before we got to COVID. But what he's actually done is he's confused correlation with causation. Um, and he hasn't actually realized context because every one of the companies he studied was the first into their market. Um, so they were apex predators. And the apex predator survives no matter how, how incompetent they are till the ecosystem changes, then they collapse. Yeah? So you, you, you have to understand context to actually get any replication. The other problem we got on this, and you guys are in New York, so if New York wants to increase the number of Nobel Prizes won by its population, all it needs to do, and this is a, a glorious intervention for you, is increase the amount of dark chocolate consumed. Because dark chocolate consumption per head of population directly correlates with Nobel Prizes per head of population for the last 30 years, and that's a much bigger data set than most management books have. Yeah, you, you can't confuse correlation with causation. Uh, and then you get um, ideology-based evidence. Probably the worst example of this, or rather the best example of it, and the worst book for anybody to read, um, is reinventing the organization by the Crocs, which is very popular in the Agile community because they want to believe in the religion he's proselytizing within that book. The reality is he was highly selective in what he took from the cases that he studied. Yeah. And those cases actually don't support the thesis. And you increasingly get that. Malcolm Gladwell in Blink is actually another example of that. He has a thesis about intuition, which he knows will sell. So as a journalist, he finds examples of where intuition has worked, and he ignores all the ones that failed. Uh, the cognitive neuroscience community produced a book called The Invisible Gorilla, deliberately designed to actually counter the false ideas which were pushed out in Blink. So all of these are problems. All of them are because people are trying to get hold of a certainty that they can't get. So one of the things I started to do years ago when I was in IBM and carried on since was to use natural science to inform social systems. Now, I think one of the reasons we've got a huge amount of work coming through at the moment, at least if we, anybody will ever pay for it, but that's a different matter, so I'm currently writing the European Union's handbook on how to manage in a crisis. And one of the reasons I'm doing that is I've been totally stubborn about the nature of complexity for the last 15 years, and people are now realizing that you can't manage complex adaptive systems in the way that people are comfortable managing. Yeah, it requires you to handle things differently, and more on that later. 
But if you actually use natural science, we know things about human cognition and we know things about systems, um, which have been subject to replicable experiments. No social scientist has ever reproduced their experiments. Yeah, and therefore we can rely on that. And when everything is suddenly changing around us, as it is at the moment, the last thing we can afford to do is to base our current actions on work, what worked in the past three decades, because it ain't going to work anymore. Uh, we need to quote Lincoln in his address to Congress, and I think 1893, we need to think anew and we need to act anew. So I'll just throw a couple of things in on this to make the point and then, then move on. Yeah. So this is from a famous set of experiments where you give radiologists um, a batch of x-rays. On the final x-ray, you hide it, well, you don't hide, you put it in plain sight. A picture of a gorilla, which is 48 times the size of a cancer nodule. You ask the radiologist to look for anomalies and 83% don't see the gorilla. And the 17% who do come to believe they were wrong when they talk with the 83%. This is called inattentional blindness. We literally do not see what we do not expect to see. And in that one slide, I've invalidated any systems analyst because systems analysts only hear from users what they expect to hear from users and they ignore the other things. And we're doing work at the moment on mapping unarticulated needs, yet using distributed ethnography, and that provides a counter or an alternative yeah, um, to that particular approach. Now, this is reality. You can't train people not to do this. So you actually have to build systems or processes, which means you're not dependent on it. So I'll give you an example of a complex systems method for requirements capture. What we do is we put together three people. This is also, by the way, a crisis management procedure. So you put, and one example of this, this is you put together a pair of people who are in your IT department. Uh, somebody kind of like young, new joiner, very bright, very fast prototyper, throws systems together without thinking about it, all good news. Yeah? And secondly, somebody who's an end system tester, a systems architect, somebody who by training experience thinks about the system as a whole. And by the way, we don't bring testers in early enough on design. It's kind of like something we should think about more. And then I put them into a trio with a user trained to talk to IT people. And just to make it clear, it's a lot easier to train users to talk to IT people than to train IT people to understand users. Right? It's kind of like a background issue. Yeah? So, and what we'll then do is we'll throw 15 trios at a problem. Yeah? So people who've never worked together for from diverse backgrounds to actually generate prototypes, generate ideas, we'll run that for three weeks before we move things into a backlog on a scrum. Yeah. You're making vague signs at me. Do, you, do I need to do something different? No, no, no. Just uh, making sure you have advanced beyond the x-ray. Yeah, so that's you know, the x-ray. Right? Um, second thing is, and again, this upsets people, negative stories are more powerful than positive stories. So if anybody's got children, you don't tell your stories, you know, about how Dick and Jane stayed at home, did what mummy and daddy said, achieved the family KPIs and had a regular evening stand-up. You know, that kind of isn't going to work. The stories you tell are about Dick and Jane went into the forest, met evil witches, etc., etc. All fairy stories, all human traditions tell stories of failure. We have sort of a happy ending at the end of it because we want people to feel comfortable. Yeah, we want them to go to sleep at night. But the reality is stories of failure have a bigger success. Uh, we actually use failure games in which people run through games in parallel in which they're doomed to fail. And the amount of data they scan by the end of the process is 25 to 30 times more than if they succeed early on. We pay more attention to failure than success. One of the ways that you give direction to an organization is not to have some set of platitudes about what sort of organization you want to be, but to create boundaries of negative stories by which you define what sort of organization you don't want to be. One of the ways you better understand users is to capture the stories of what they don't want as well as the stories of what they do want. And just to be clear on this, the brain is trained or rather has evolved to pick up negativity more than it equips positivity. 
So we, again, we need to live to use that. We need to learn to use that. And then we get into complexity theory. This is a quote from Brian Arthur. So complexity is about looking at multiply entangled systems. Yeah? So systems which have so many connections that you just can't know what those connections are. And the nature of entanglement can change a lot. Alicia Gerraro has actually got a really good metaphor for you. She talks about a complex system is like bramble bushes in a thicket. Now, if you think about a thicket as a small wood, yeah, a set of trees, and you've got bramble bushes which have grown and entangled themselves with the trees with each other, you can't separate any of the elements without destroying the system, but it still produces fruit. This is a pile of fishermen's nets. Um, if you try and pick it up, it will get entangled, but if the fisherman picks it up, it won't. So it's a type of thing which could get entangled if the wrong people addresses it. And then the new work we're doing on systems architecture, which I'll happily talk about if people want, um, is to actually entangle people's timelines. So, for example, in a medical system, I can entangle different people's experiences around points of coherence. And therefore, the architecture of the system can actually evolve um, as people entangle around what's called a scaffolding, which I'll come back to in a minute. Yeah? So complex adaptive systems are always about emergence. So the key thing to understand about complex system is you can't define an endpoint uh, because they're not causal in nature. They now have no linear material relationship between cause and effect. Yeah. As a result of which what matters is there's only three things we can manage in a complex adaptive system. Um, the constraints, the catalysts, and the amplification strategies. So constraints can be positive or negative. People who grow up with gold rat and theory of constraints often don't get this. Um, without constraints, and I'm still on the complexity side, right? without constraints, you know, basically um, no evolution takes place. But there's a key distinction between enabling constraints, i.e. the way that things connect with each other so that any tr transmission is lower, and governing constraints which restricts what's possible. So designing and managing enabling constraints increases, increases the chance of beneficial evolution, reduces the energy cost of system design. Um, catalysts are experimental probes. And I can manage the catalysts, but not the results. So the key thing is multiple small experiments in parallel, not in sequence. That's one of the things that Scrum gets wrong. It does things in sequence, not in parallel. Which is why, in Nevin terms, it's a liminal technique to shift things from the complex to the complicated. And it's really good at doing that. Don't get me wrong. It's brilliant at doing that. But it's not a complex systems technique. It's a complex to complicated transition set of methods. Yeah. Um, so catalysts are effectively... <laughs> somebody needs to mute themselves right um, if we can if we can get a stable pattern then we put more energy into that and unstable patterns or patterns we don't want we remove energy so in a complex adaptive system constraints catalysts energy allocation and that has major implications for systems design right, in terms of the way we work so that leads into Kinevin. I'm not going to do the Kinevin framework now. There's more than enough material on that. But one of the points about Kinevin is it's a mechanism yeah, by which you can take a multi-methods approach. So one of the things which I think is fundamentally wrong about the whole Agile movement at the moment is everybody wants their proprietary technique to be a universal. Um, they haven't realized that different things work for different people. Interestingly, I was one of the three founders of the DSDM consortium, uh, which was actually the first you know, formal methods body for RAD and JAD, for rapid application development. Because we were British, we met one evening for dinner in a pub in Cheltenham. We didn't go for three a week in a ski resort, but that's a different approach, right? Um, the key thing about that is three competitors created it. It wasn't created by one company in order to be proprietary. And that's been one of the big issues with Agile. Too many single purpose proprietary companies creating methods. So from my point of view, what Kinevin basically says is different methods work in different spaces. There's nothing wrong with Waterfall if you've got a highly ordered system. 
And I remember working with Telstra in Australia, and I mean, they're doing massive infrastructure projects. And there's plenty of quotes on this. Martin and other people have pointed this out. Agile is actually not good at infrastructure projects. It's good at high volatility, fast turnover type projects, but it's not good at infrastructure. Um, so one of the things that comes out of that is that, it, that nobody could get promoted if they weren't agile because that was the current fan. So they created one year sprints so they could actually say they would be an agile but not change. And I rather admired them for that. I don't admire Dean for safe, but I do admire those Australian software engineers because they were working around idiocy. Uh, we've all forgotten about time boxes, which was a classic jab technique. Yeah, because we got obsessed with two week sprints. Actually, time boxing is an extremely effective technique of managing ambiguity. Yeah, where you've got limited range of options. We will deliver on this date, but we'll vary, vary the resource or vary what we deliver, but we'll always give you something on this date, which is an approach to MVP, which again, people have forgotten and not used. Scrum, as I say, is a brilliant technique for managing the transition from complex to complicated. But then we need other techniques like giving you trios. Yeah? Another technique which we developed originally 20 years ago in DSDM, which I'm bringing back at the moment and codifying, is called triple eight or deliberate mutation. And what the first time we did that, we had a software team in Farnborough. So we did a joint application design session. Again, something Agile has forgotten. So that's users working together intensively with prototypers to build prototypes. So one day you end up with a prototype. This is what we think the system is. And by the way, good prototypers are generally not good people to have on a big team. They're, they're, they're good at knocking things together, but they're poor at disciplined execution. Yeah? So the, what we did is over eight hours, we did that. And then we sent it on to a team in um, Mumbai. We didn't tell them what the user requirement was. We just sent them the prototype and gave them eight hours to improve it. Then they sent it on to a team in San Jose yeah, this is like Chinese whispers, we call it in England, or telegraph, I think, is a children's game in Australia. So we deliberately allowed two mutations where people didn't know the requirement, but they saw the output. Every time we've done that, when it comes back to the users the next day, they say, God, I wouldn't have thought of that. Can I please have it? Yeah? And that's a really simple 24-hour, 48-hour technique, which can actually make a huge amount of difference. Yeah. Um, and there's other tools and techniques. The key principle is different tools and techniques from different vendors should be able to interface with each other and you should know when to use them. And I think that's where we need to go beyond scale. Yeah. Um, and I disagree with Bob, I'm afraid. I think actually frameworks are actually critical. Um, yes, we need to manage work in progress, but if you take something like Kanban, right? Kanban is in its representation is highly complicated. It's a highly structured approach. It doesn't handle high levels of ambiguity. Um, without a framework, you don't know what tools and techniques to actually apply. Yeah? And you can have all the values you want, but value is such a platitude, anybody can interpret value to mean whatever they mean it to mean. Uh, you need to have a different way of doing it. So sorry, I, I kind of like disagree with that. Yeah? Um, okay, so part of that is this sort of principle. Yeah, not everybody comes to the office in the same car or not everybody at home has got the same working environment. I mean, my office, or rather my study here is inherently messy. If I put the camera down, you'd see the floor and I'm not prepared to show that in public because it's piles and piles of books and papers. You've got my Starbucks mug collection there. You know, I collect city mugs. Um, it's a messy environment. I've seen other people in Zoom environments who have an absolutely structured environment. My sister, when she worked for home for IBM, and she didn't like working from home, she got rid of a spare bedroom, made a sparse office, and would get dressed every morning, yet walk around the block and come into the office, and she wouldn't even use her own kitchen. And then at the end of the day, she'd walk back again. But she was a systems programmer, and they're always a bit strange anyway. Right? Um, the point is different people work in different environments, different people use different tools. And there's a key concept here, which the Agile community needs to learn fast, and it's called coherent heterogeneity. What you need is lots of radical difference, but the ability for it to cohere when it needs to cohere. At the moment, every Agile method I've seen is trying to force a particular person's vision of homogeneity on the whole. And we, we need that. That's that going back to the wild thing. So 
three principles of complex adaptive systems. I'll just throw these out. Yeah, one is the granularity of what you need to deal with is key. If you're dealing with complexity, you need lots of different methods. That's more finely grained, not one thing which consolidates all of those methods. That's a safe approach. In a crisis, you reduce the size of teams very quickly, but you have overlap so that they can interact with each other. We need to diversify cognition. What we do in unarticulated need management is we capture a huge amount of anecdotal data from people's work practice. But then we give programmers direct access to those anecdotes. We don't construct it into story points, yeah, or let alone into epics. Because the minute you synthesize something, you lose things which may be important. That's a key session on weak signal detection. And that's a disintermediation. Decision makers need to look directly at raw data. Um, in terms of scaling, uh, granularity matters again. But you don't scale a complex adaptive system by aggregation or imitation. You scale it by decomposition and recombination. So you break it down into different things and allow them to recombine. And if you think about it, the whole of organic life form comes from different combinations of four chemicals in DNA. Yeah? So scaling by doing more of it or you know, that, that sort of aggregation is actually the wrong approach. What you need is to decompose and recombine in context. And that's kind of like the multi-methods approach which I've been talking about. And the final thing which I wanted to reference, yeah, which is kind of like important. David, are you still audible? We have some Zoom glitching. Sort of ambiguity, then you define objects as software and people, and the objects interact points of coherence on the scaffolding and thus application And then people self-interpret those stories at the point of origin into a non-gameable graphical index set. This is a product called SenseMaker. You can look at the site. And from it, we get these type of maps. Now, what that map says is that different parts of the organization actually see the world in different ways. So kind of like if you look at the green in the center, that's a culture which overlaps all the other cultures. Conversations are possible. The red on the right is almost sort of leaving the culture, it's becoming distinct. Remember I talked about 17%? We use this same technique to find people who are thinking differently. Yeah. So on that culture map, that basically says the way I change things is I say, well, what I'd really like is everything to be closer to that green area. <clears throat> so what I do is go to the extremes of the blue and say, and I click on that and I can then read the stories that people told. And I can say I need fewer stories like that and more stories like the green one. And that's how you change culture. More stories like these, fewer stories like that. You don't say I need you to be more customer centric because people will be insulted by that to say we are. But you show them stories which have been gathered by from people like them and say more stories like these and fewer stories like those. And then a final point and then I'll finish. Um, I just thought I'd give you a, you know, if you haven't read the Just So stories, I grew up on these, yeah? They're by Kipling. Um, wonderful stories, like how the elephant got its trunk. But the first story 
is about how man domesticated creatures, and it is, it's male orientated, but the female role is quite interesting. So basically the horse is domesticated by offer of sweet smelling hay. So is the cow. The dog is, you know, basically um, domesticated by offer of a, of a bone. But the cat wants the benefits of being there, but doesn't want to be domesticated. And so he tricks the humans into letting him drink the milk and rest by the fire. But his famous phrase is, I am the cat who walked by himself and all places are alike unto me. And so the final metaphor I want to give you is, I live in a house owned by two cats. People who are owned by cats understand complexity. People who want dogs are trying to control complexity. And even if you disagree with it, it will kind of like make the point. Okay, open to questions. Open to arguments as well, I don't mind. And uh, please mute and mute yourself uh, just for the, for the question itself. Then keep, let's keep the noise volume down, folks. Thank you. Uh, the floor is open. Hi, this is Lucy. Go ahead, Lucy. Hi, um, Dave, first of all, an honor to, to be in a virtual presence with you. Uh, thank you for taking your time today. Um, could you explain a little bit more about the coherent homogeneity? Can you ex expand okay. on that a bit? Okay, so the best thing, I should probably warn my Cardiff Blues rugby jersey for this, right? So there are four rugby teams in South Wales, and rugby away is a real game. Yeah, it, it, we don't have padding and stop for 10, 20 minutes for rest continuously, all right? I, I can go to gridiron if I go as an anthropologist, but not as a sports fan, right? So there are four teams in South Wales. You know, there's those of us in Cardiff Blues who are sort of, you know, good rugby players, we're honest, you know, we have integrity, we respect the referee, and there's those bastards in Clinatley who constantly cheat, bribe the referee, and, you know, they're, they're absolute bastards, right? But when the English come, we all wear red jerseys and we're Welsh. So what you've got is diversity that can come together in different contexts. You get the point? Yeah? So the issue is you want enough diversity that the system has resilience, but the ability for it to cohere quickly when the system requires alignment. And the problem with all these people talking about common values, common beliefs, is A, it's never happened. The minute you, I mean, this, this is 101 anthropology, and we need to study more of this. The minute you write your values down, you just lost them. Because now everybody knows the language of power, and everybody will game it. Yeah, real culture is, is the things we do, not the things we say. Did, did that answer the question? David, quick question. Is your battery running low at 10%? Someone was, someone was pinging me saying that it's my... No, that's just what it was on the slide at some stage, so don't worry about it. Right, the the, the yeah. battery on my computer, is, it's on, no on, the, on, and on the mains. Don't worry. Yeah. No worries. Um, anyone else? Thank you, Lucy. There were I some mean, comments in, um, the, in the chat. There were some strong comments in the chat. Well, if you, if you look at the actually, no, they, they don't miss it because they're not looking for it. That's exactly the point. They don't expect to see it, so they miss it, right? Yeah. And that, that's the problem, all right? And the other problem is most IT people are towards the autistic end of the spectrum because you have to be to handle the maths these days, all right? Nothing wrong. I actually argued this in Google. I said, go and employ people with Asperger's syndrome because they're brilliant coders. So the way they see the world is different from the way their users see it. I mean, I was lucky. I grew up in the days of 4GLs. I programmed, I was, I was actually a development accountant. I'd run, I'd run businesses. So when I coded, I knew what they wanted. Right? I couldn't do that anymore. And I actually knew the things that they wanted that they couldn't articulate to me. And this is the whole problem with Scrum and with Kanban. It's all about clearing the backlog. And what people want is the backlog to be tightly defined so they can clear it. And the reality is users don't think like that. Yeah. So you, you, you've got to create systems in which you find the 17%, the people who are seeing things differently from everybody else, and it's never been more critical in the current day. Hey, David, I'm going to throw an anchoring question, although it's, it's, it's for me, from Gene, but people keep, you know, pinging me privately. So maybe you can just circle once again 
on your perception of large unpack and install commercially successful frameworks and large consult consultancies consultancies okay and any views on that that you want to like the, the fact that something sells doesn't mean it's the right thing yeah i mean that that's actually really worries me i mean I, i've got this I, mean, I had this argument with jürgen apollo and this bloody stupid management 3.0 stuff all right I mean, anybody who says they're 3.0, 4.0, or 5.0 is basically, you know, that is, it, they're selling snake oil, right? Um, I called it Magpie 3.0. Uh, because what he does is he assembles things from other people he doesn't understand, including Kneven, and throws them into a book, right? Now, that's actually quite dangerous. But his argument back to me was people are buying it, so it must be right. Right? Now, that's actually not the case. I have lived through so many Godon fans. You know, business process re-engineering, Six Sigma, um, Blue Ocean Strategy, Learning Organization. You know, all of these things have all been justified on the basis of some individual's assessment of cases, which are partial. They've surged, dominated, and they've collapsed. And the only reason people adopt them is because everybody else is adopting them. So we saw that was safe, all right? So the Air Force in the States came out with a statement which was completely valid, safe is a waste of space, all right? Two months later, we've got this highly qualified, well, I didn't really mean to say that, I meant to say this, because the pressure has come on, all right, to do what everybody else is doing because that is safe, right? I mean, the Dean is brilliant at marketing, right? Um, the consultancies grew on the back of business process re-engineering. They weren't management consultancies before then. But what BPR did was to create a market for large teams of analytical consultants. And the management consultancies grew on that. The brilliance of, um, uh, God, what was it, the German company, SAP, was to basically allow consultancies to gain the implementation revenue. No, nobody had done that before, so the consultancy wanted to sell it. Then it became the norm. Yeah. And now, actually, companies are suddenly realizing just how bad things are because they can't change it. It takes so long to reconfigure that the market is changing faster than your support in software can change to match it. All right. And I think the big consultancies will die on COVID. Say that one more time. I think the big consultancies will die on COVID. COVID is bringing complexity in as a new paradigm. It needs, it needs a trigger event, right? So basically, all of the systems thinking approaches that everybody talks about, you know, common values, the current nonsense of talking about purpose. I mean, purpose is just the old value stuff repurposed, sorry. It, and it's another set of platitudes. And I spent for one of the big oil companies a highly enjoyable dinner. They paid for the dinner and a consultancy fee. Yeah, where a group of us tore their purpose statement apart and pointed out how easily it could be distorted by their staff. And we did a narrative capture in all the staff on their water cooler conversations and discovered exactly what we'd said. Yeah, it, it created the wrong approach. All of that stuff, all right, is based on the assumption you can define an endpoint. Yeah, and this is what happened with systems thinking. It started in the 80s and it said basically the way we handle complexity is say where we want to go and close the gap. Yeah? And the trouble is in a complex system, you can't do that. In a complex system, you work out where the fuck you are. Sorry about the language. Then you evolve forward from that. It's a free enterprise. You start journeys. You don't try and achieve goals. And I taught leadership with Peter Drucker, right? Which meant I was the only person not invited to the Peter Drucker Forum on Complexity because the last thing they want is somebody who actually talked with him, right? And one of the things, the conclusions we came to is that scientific management and complexity theory have a lot in common because they both respect human judgment. In scientific management, people stayed in companies for life. They went through apprentice models. Yeah, there was a huge amount of human judgment in the process between the silos. Systems thinking has systematically tried to get rid of human judgment and restricted the process. If you look at HR practice, I mean, I had a high performing team for God's sake. We were the most profitable team in the company for five years running. And then I got given the HR profile of what my salary should be like, because the assumption was I would have 40% underperformers. I only recruited internally. So I had to take on a massive project with a bunch of idiots to work on it so I could get my profile right to pay my people what I needed to pay. And that was the nonsense of the engineering metaphor. 
Human beings are a complex anthro ecosystem. They're not a machine. And the entire metaphor of the last 30 years has been the metaphor of machines and the dominance of engineers. I love engineers, but we could do with more civil engineers and few software engineers. Civil engineers understand the harsh reality of things not working. Sorry, I get passionate about this stuff. So. We want passionate people there. That's why I hear. Um, so if someone is you know, dying to clarify if you said large consultants as well. Well, the McKinsey's oh, one is a good COVID. example. All right, M McKinsey's is classic, all right? Nobody who's any good in Agile would work for something like McKinsey's because they'd be brain reamed into the process. I mean, this is the modern form of the board. And they've lost all their good thought leaders on business as well. So they've got these young, bright kids from university who just, I mean, I've just seen their pamphlet on what to do about COVID. It's hysterical. It's kind of like, you know, somebody who's just done an MBA repeating what the MBA lecturer said. Their agile stuff is just hysterically funny, right? And this used to be a great consultancy firm. Yeah, they, they, they just haven't got it. Thank you for clarifying. Uh, there was a gentleman... Uh... I'm just going to paraphrase in, in case if I missed it. Curious about which domain the thinking behind um, exiting lockdown should be. Thoughts? Uh, so that's from John Coleman, someone I know, the colleague of mine. Oh, the, um, yeah, kind of like, well, I need to be careful here because I'm working on it. Um, I think the issue is, and the trouble is, what you've got is countries making decisions as countries, whereas they shouldn't. All right, this is the context aspect of complexity. I'm writing this up at the moment, all right? So, for example, I live in the middle of the country, all right? I'm allowed out on exercise once a day. Okay? Now, technically, it's meant to be an hour, but if I do manage to get out, and I'm forcing myself to get out on three days, I take the bike out. I'm a roadie, um, which means I understand meditation. Mountain bikers are just adrenaline junkies, and they never reflect, all right? Um, so, and I don't take the bike out for less than 50 kilometers. So I'm spinning out 50 or 70 kilometers, that's 30, 50 miles, yeah? Um, I hardly see anybody, I'm completely safe. I couldn't do that in London, right? And cities are different, right? And you've got this real problem in the States is that you've got less infection in rural areas and they're also all, all red states, right? And the problem is that could be the second wave. Right? And nobody's thinking about that. So the lockdown is, is, is you, you change some constraints to be semi-permeable, see what happens, because you can always make them less permeable downstream. So it's a gradual process. But what we said in the EU handbook, and I'll give you it, is the minute you get a crisis, there's two things you need to do, map the constraints and manage them fast. Yeah, that's the crisis management. Yeah. Set up an innovation team. Distribute learning mechanisms to everybody in the organization. If you look at the blog, which has just gone up, right? We're now creating, we've now created a journaling system by which people can continuously capture learning during the crisis. And you need an innovation team because you never had a better chance to innovate. And thirdly, you need an unintended consequences team. Something which models and tests and exploits unintended consequences. Because that's the only thing you've got for certain. Yeah. yeah, and then what the way you manage the progress is you manage, and I go back to it constraints, catalysts, and energy. And the other key thing is you coordinate in the center, you don't make decisions. The center coordinates, but it distributes decision making. And so, one of the things we're doing that, for example, in medical practice, is we're creating trios. I've got to have confidence if I distribute decision making, I shouldn't do it to individuals. We're creating a trio. So if a doctor and a nurse with five years experience and somebody from a patient representative group agree on something, you can do it, but otherwise you can't. So we, we create a structure around distributed decision-making, which gives the center, center capability. Yeah. David, thank you very much. I'm just being conscious of time. People are gonna start dropping. We have a few minutes yeah. left. There was one person who is uh, very anxious to ask the question. Elena, if you're still in the queue, I'm here. Yeah. So my, my question, Dave, is, and thank you. I mean, I, we attended your session at Agile Camp and it's just as good. Thank you for being here. The question that I have uh, is if large consulting companies like McKinsey and Accenture are recommending to go uh, following SAFE or Spotify model, what should organizations' response be? 
Uh, well, A, they should kind of like grow up. I mean, I, I know of about 15 cases where people have abandoned SAFE, but they're not saying it because they spent so much money on it. Again, that was Dean's genius. Yeah, if somebody spends eight or nine million on an implementation, they'll probably move on before the consequences are known. That's an executive characteristic and they won't admit failure. So one is, why the hell would you do it? And if it's Spotify, go and talk to Spotify because they basically say there isn't a Spotify model, don't adopt it. If it does actually happen, well, you just have to work around it. The only reason that SAFE works is that people largely ignore it. That they do what they think is right anyway. And that's how, I mean, I've survived bureaucracies all my life. It's okay, what's the current fad? What's the minimum we have to do? And we'll just get on with the job. Yeah. And there's a, there's a massive amount of waste as a result. I, I would take the multi-methods approach. So why are we adopting one approach, which is very expensive, yeah, why don't we take a multi-methods approach and give people a degree of autonomy because that's the agile principle and see if you can get there. But nobody gets fired for implementing a McKinsey's report. Remember, I mean, IBM sold hardware on that basis. They, they, I mean, I remember trying to sell a debt Bax cluster against the bloody IBM AS400. The Bax cluster was a damn sight better, but nobody was going to get fired if they implemented an IBM solution and it failed. But if they implemented our solution and it failed, they would get into personal trouble. And that's where McKinsey's and the big consultancy survive. Yeah, that because you've implemented their idea, you're not going to get fired if it goes wrong. You can say, well, McKinsey's recommended it. Folks, thank you, Dave. Thank you for clarifying the yeah. question. Uh, any, uh, one more question we'll take before we um, have to wrap this. Um, and David's time is also, and we need to give it back to him. Uh, anyone else? There's, an, there's a private question, I'll answer it generally. Please do. Yeah, goals don't work, so that's why purpose statements and value statements are a waste of time. The politically astute people gain the language and the wrong people get promoted. You define negative stories, I, we don't want to go there, and you can get consensus on that quite easily. You map people's day-to-day -day narratives and you do more stories like this, fewer stories like that, and you measure whether you're going in the right direction but you never actually declare, you never make your goals explicit because then they'll be gained. Yeah. Okay. Excellent, we held up the time. Stuff that, that, that my blog post today and tomorrow will have stuff on COVID. So um, uh, you can link in on that. That yeah. would be great. Could you send it to me and I'll distribute it. I will do. Yeah. And your deck, if you don't mind sending the PDF, yeah. I'll, I'll, I'll do that on my side for it. So, okay. uh, you personally, uh, thanks a lot for Pleasure. being here. It was great talk. It was great in content. And, you know, I, I wish you well and stay safe. And hopefully we can do this again sometime soon. Well, and unsafe, I think, is what we are about. Oh, these. did you say unsafe? <laughs> okay. Okay, guys. Cheers. Thank you very much, Dave. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you, everyone, Dave. for joining, folks. Stay healthy. Be well. Bye for now. Thank you. We're going to cut. Mm -hmm. Thank you.